Good afternoon. I'd like to open this event with a land acknowledgement. UCLA acknowledges our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. My name is Joel Cayley. I'm a business development officer at UCLA's technology development group. Our mission is to partner with UCLA's research community to market innovations that benefit society. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on extended reality in the arts and humanities. I've been interested in virtual reality since Jaron Lanier's pioneering work in the 80s, and I've eagerly watched the seeds he planted grow and blossom into the extended reality we enjoy today. TDG believes the time is ripe for a greater focus on extended reality. We seek to promote UCLA's ongoing extended reality discoveries, to support companies and entrepreneurs who want to broadly share our innovations, and we invite the extended community to collaborate with UCLA to push the boundaries of what's possible. With that, it is my privilege to introduce the organizers of this webinar, Maya Manuelovich, Joy Guay, and Francesca Albrezzi. Thank you, Joel, so much for your welcoming remarks. On behalf of all of the presenters, I'd like to thank the TDG team for hosting us and helping us organize this webinar. I'd also like to extend special thanks to the Chair of Digital Humanities, Todd Fresner, and Associate Vice Chancellor, Amir Nyberg, for inviting us to present our work. Welcome to our webinar. We are members of the core group that founded the UCLA XR Initiative. XR Initiative is a hub for the UCLA faculty, students, and staff interested in XR. XR stands for extended reality, encompassing virtual, augmented, and mixed realities, as well as haptics technologies. We see the XR technologies as crossing disciplinary boundaries and organically bringing together people from diverse backgrounds to explore, experiment, and create with these tools. Moreover, after seeing our world go remote, it's clear that XR expands our options to communicate and collaborate in very concrete ways.
So as stated on our website, the UCLA XR Initiative's main goals are to continue expanding our X-Reality website, hold virtual open house events showcasing the work at XR Labs on our campus and beyond, set up informal meetings, mini workshops, and symposia on XR. Offer consultations on XR projects and pedagogy and organize a larger conference to cultivate connections with XR researchers, artists, and industry professionals internationally. Our ultimate goal is to establish a UCLA-wide XR Center. If you're interested in contributing to any of our activities or participating in any way, join us. You can find a link in the chat. We're looking forward to forging new connections and welcoming funding op opportunities. Contact us and let's begin creating together. For this webinar, we've assembled snapshots of seven XR initiative affiliated UCLA faculty and staff working with XR at the intersections of arts and humanities. They will present their XR research and creative projects and how they use XR in the classroom. Here are the presenters in order of appearance. Steve Mamber with his teaching app for research of 3D film in VR. Anthony Caldwell and Joy Goy with their architectural reconstructions on Broadway. Danny Snelson with his experiments in XR for remote teaching. Anna Lee Rugg, Tom Garbalati, and Maya Manoilovic with their concept for Scribe VR, an app for creating or for creative composing. David Gear and Francesca Alprezzi documenting an exhibition of stories by people living with HIV in a 360 degree environment. Steve Anderson with a creative VR installation designed to reflect on UCLA's diverse community. And finally, Jeff Burke with an experimental multimedia performance with AR and MR. We would also love to collect some of your thoughts and experiences about XR. In a few short seconds, you should see an anonymous poll launch on your screen. If you can fill this out, that would really help us, and we can share the results at the end as well. Thank you. So in the chat as well, we're going to share a link of our event page where you can find uh, links to the virtual hubs environment as well as the YouTube playlist for today's presentations and their transcripts, along with several related resources. And our format for today's webinar is tailored to our topic. To showcase the exciting things that XR can do, we've leveraged the online virtual platform Mozilla Hubs and filmed a walkthrough of our customized virtual environment that houses today's presentation videos. There will be two live Q&A sessions following each of the pre-recorded presentation segments. One after the first four presentations with XR research applicable to teaching, and the other after the last three presentations focused on creative XR projects and performance. Please type your questions in the chat and preface them with the names of the presenters or title of their project. So it's easier to fill your questions. Thank you. And with that, let's get started. Hello, this is Stephen Mamber. I'm a professor in the Department of Film, Television, and Digital Media. And I'm going to give you about a three minute crash course in virtual reality. And then I'm going to show you a sneak preview of a, a VR app I've been working on for about the last year. This quote, cinema has not yet been invented. Uh, is from a French film critic, and what he meant by cinema was uh, there was always an idea that uh, uh, black and white, uh, small frame 2D cinema was um, uh, only a technological shortcoming, and that what cinema ought to be is really something like what we're calling 
virtual reality now, although virtual reality still has to uh, evolve to uh, come to that idea of uh, uh, moving in space completely without uh, uh, any sense of it being different from uh, reality. That's why I wanted to give you the quick history just to see that's the way the world has moved over the last uh, century and a half or so, starting from photography to cinema to radio to television to digital vi video to multimedia to virtual reality. And also it's important to note that cinema technology, which dominated most of the 20th century, was always evolving. It added sound, it added color, it added 3D, it added widescreen, uh, it even added stereo sound. Okay, a quick answer to the question, what is uh, virtual reality? I think probably a better term for it is interactive 3D, although what you call it probably doesn't matter so much. But if we call it interactive 3D, where does it come from? And it comes from two major sources. One is 360 degree video, and the other is uh, it can be modeled in 3D software. And uh, game engines these days also are 3D modeling tools. So it's this combination of combining video and 3D modeling that I think creates uh, virtual reality or interactive 3D. And uh, some of the objectives, as we know, one is simply exploring a simulated space. Another is while we're doing it, we want to interact, which means grab stuff, point at things, shoot, all of that, a kind of combination of exploring and uh, playing with the environment like in a game. And uh, another big question and one I'm interested in is maybe it can also be a learning environment. And this is probably my most important slide and my whole little thing, uh, which is to say that you should try to understand 3D in order to understand VR. And navigating in depth and in 360 degrees is what virtual reality is all about. And uh, I think the really important idea is that 2D, like we're used to from movies and television, and 3D of the forms we get in virtual reality are extremely different. And the question I would ask is what uh, difference does depth make? And the answer is a lot. And film has been experimenting with 3D for at least 70 years. So that's where my big idea has been. Let's use 3D movies to begin to understand VR. So here's a two slide fast history of 3D in the movies. Uh, big in the 1950s, movies like Hitchcock's Style M for Murder, House of Wax was a big one. There's Rock Hudson and the immortal Taza, son of uh, Cochise, as described at the top as thrilling in 3D. It went away because people complained about headaches or CinemaScope is really what killed it, which was a widescreen process that uh, claimed to uh, uh, replace 3D. The lesser known really important story about 3D in the movies, though, is that this century it's had a pretty big uh, uh, comeback, a renaissance. And uh, I think what's really interesting about it is that there's uh, 10 or 15 major directors all of whom have done at least one film in 3D, usually trying to experiment with the possibilities of the medium. And uh, this is a bunch of films that's really interested me. I'm uh, showing on the screen about eight of those uh, films that I've uh, taken a great interest in. So now to my VR app. My big discovery was that if you take 3D films, they can be viewed in virtual reality without glasses. I'm going to make that clear again because it's, I think, hard to accept, is that it used to be to watch 3D, you needed, uh, you needed special glasses to do it. When you put on a VR headset, you can watch a 3D movie uh, in 3D uh, in VR, and I think that's a very big deal. Um, in order to do something with this, I had to uh, first figure out how to convert 3D Blu-ray video to a 3D format that would play in VR because naturally uh, formats are never the same as you move from one technology to another. But uh, after much experimentation, I figured out how you could take uh, a 3D Blu-ray and uh, uh, make clips that I could use within a VR app. So I got a hold of uh, 
uh, an Oculus Rift S as my VR device. Um, I found that Unity had very good uh, tools for VR, although I had to uh, figure out the way to actually show 3D movies within Unity, but I found a way to do that. So uh, what, I wanted, what I wanted to be able to do, my basic objective, was to uh, be able to play th uh, 3D clips from selected films together with my annotations of what uh, that 3D will, uh, uh, was doing so that it could be better understood. I think my idea is that we're learning about VR through studying 3D movies. And I did also want to test VR as an environment for developing media literacy skills and generally as a way to teach, not just for 3D movies. Okay, we'll let this play. And uh, what you'll see is uh, selecting a movie and then when you pick a clip, text comes up that goes with it. And you can also control uh, when it plays and going back to the Not story. Not that one, the other one. That, uh, kind of thing. <laughs> And I'll emphasize again that when you're watching this in a headset, that uh, that uh, film is uh, showing hey, in 3D. Uh, I'll look again. Please don't go And now, just to show we can do it, we'll go back to the uh, list of all of the movies so that we could pick another one. I think we're getting uh, Dial M for Murder here, and see that there's a bunch of examples with that, and that. Uh, of course, you can go play those again too, so you can quickly move from film to film as well. So I hope at least that gives you a quick idea of in 2D of what a 3D VR app uh, looks like. And uh, I've done two films so far, and I've got eight more to go, and I'm going to try to get some feedback on it eventually and experiment with some other teaching possibilities. Thanks a lot. Hi everyone, my name is Anthony Caldwell and I'm the Associate Director of the Digital Research Consortium in the YRL and I'm joined here today by my colleague. Hi, I'm Joy Gui and I'm the Emerging Technology Advocate at the Social Sciences Center for Education, Research and Technology. For those who don't know, the Digital Humanities Capstone is a small seminar offered by a faculty member that serves as a research laboratory focused on some aspect of the faculty member's digital research, allowing students opportunities to experience and explore other disciplines. So this capstone focuses on the historic theaters in downtown Los Angeles and investigates how these monuments were constructed using a variety of methods, such as archival research, photogrammetry, 3D modeling, data visualizations, as well as VR and AR tools. The projects you're about to see represent students' work from the last few years. Each theater on Broadway has a story to tell that connects it to the Broadway Theater District and more broadly to the historic core of downtown Los Angeles. The question this capstone wanted to explore was how to tell the stories and rich history each building had to offer. How could we transport someone walking down Broadway and stopping in front of the Million Dollar Theater today to 1919? Today, just about everyone has a mobile device of some kind. This seemed to be an obvious and well-established mechanism to present our stories. The project started by looking for examples of mobile applications that combined AR and architecture. One example found was the Museum of London Street Museum application. Although very impressive, it was costly and had a long development time. Our solution had to be simpler, doable within a 10-week quarter, and cost next to nothing. Some of the questions that needed to be answered were how will the mobile device know where it is? GPS and cell tower triangulation were not as precise as we would need. Environmental issues also needed to be considered. Historically, downtown has always been a very busy place. Traffic, light, and noise needed to be considered. The trigger and display of information needed to be simple. 
After some experimentation, it was found that mobile devices in concert with QR codes could be used to precisely locate the mobile device and load content. Placed along the path, QR codes could be used to create a tour. The students decided to build a proof of concept by building a simple WordPress backend to display information about several theaters triggered by QR codes. One example of this approach is a tour created for use inside the Million Dollar Theater. Above the ceiling in the main lobby is a series of murals that have been hidden away for decades. These murals and other elements in the theater depict the scenes from the Victorian fairy tale, The King of the Golden River. The tour allowed the viewer to see information about elements both visible and hidden. The tour ends with emphasizing the importance of preserving these architectural treasures for future generations. For the class final presentation, a demonstration was held in the Scholarly Innovation Lab at UCLA. Members of the theater preservation community, including the board of the Los Angeles Theater Foundation, were invited to interact with the project and the students. Another project we'd like to showcase is from our reimagined marketing team. These students decided to study how the theaters used to market themselves in the past and how they would be able to modernize these strategies for the present. They realized that with so many options for home entertainment, such as streaming services and other multimedia platforms, it would make more sense to highlight the historic value of these theaters, which sets them apart from the other offerings. So they made a short 360 experience because it would be easily accessible, highly shareable on social media, and be a way to entice others to visit these theaters. Unfortunately, you may be witnessing one of the last walkthroughs of this tour since the tool will be shut down by Google next month. However, there is a community-led effort to create an open source replacement to the site, since it has been crucial to many VR artists and educators who use 3D models and 360 videos in their classrooms. Next, we'll have our past student come and introduce his project. Hi, Francis. Thank you so much for joining us today. Do you mind starting out by talking a little bit about the project you completed in the capstone? All right, so this is my project, which is the photogrammetry of the theater. Of course, I started to research, research the history of the theater. So I turned out I create kind of the three timeline, which is how the theater from uh, move from the beginning, the construction, and then the history to, uh, towards the modern era. And then I, of course, we went to the site and then I took photo and then import into the program software. And then turns out a virtual model will be generated from those photos I took. And then once the camera recognized the image, they will op automatically project the photogrammetry model on it. And then we'll kind of give you a, a real time interaction with the model. Were you able to use your, uh, your project in your own portfolio afterwards? Uh, for uh, an interview later on, I did put this product into my portfolio because I think this one specifically really demonstrate like my skill side and also my intention to use the digital tool to uh, present the cultural and or historical uh, humanity approach, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. So what would, um, what kind of excites you about the potential of XR and using that in your field? For architecture, which is my own major that I think one thing of course is the documentation of the existing building that you always can use AR or VR plus photogrammetry, for example, to recreate uh, a building that far from the audience. And then of course the other one goes without saying it's design aspect. So I think this, like the, the tools like AR or VR can definitely unlock the possibilities for them or for the designer to experience what they design in real time. I guess the last question I have was like, what was kind of your biggest takeaway from taking the capstone? It, I think the biggest takeaway, of course, is the opportunities of using AR in my case as the, the media for like a practical application. So I think it's really crucial that students really 
can get a chance to actually apply what they learn. I think this class allows you to be yourself while you are still within the academic framework to, to use certain knowledge and tools to achieve, to contribute to a, a larger ambitions. Thank you so much for sharing yes. your insight. Of course. I hope Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this brief summary of our capstone. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Danny Snelson. I am an assistant professor in the Department of English at UCLA and part of the core faculty of the Digital Humanities program. My research and teaching concern internet cultures, emerging genres online, poetry and poetics, and media studies. Today, I'm here to present some recent experiments in my classes that use XR, that is to say augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, in a few surprising or unexpected ways. Now, most of these ways involve trying to break out of Zoom in one way or another, uh, hence the title, uh, while teaching at a distance. So I will outline these uh, in a relatively improvisational way to give you a sense of what we've been doing. To start with, I'd like to point to a course called GEMS. This is Gaming Experiments and Multimedia Scripting. Here, I've pushed students to create games as a way to produce scholarship. This is an example of one student's Unity produced poem. You can see the roses are red and violets are blue here. Uh, but if you were to play this game, you would also be able to navigate this environment in a simulated 3D space. Uh, if there are more time, I would guide you through each of these, but I'm going to be moving through them relatively quickly. The other course I want to talk about is called Graphic Narratives and Comics Poetics. Now, this class I've offered twice, and it's really a study, a deep dive into comics and the meaning-making systems that comics produce. To get into close readings of comics, though, one has to get close to the page, which is very difficult to do at a distance. So I've used a number of platforms. Uh, pictured here is High Fidelity, a 3D virtual audio system where you can hear those around you and navigate a shared space to do close readings on the page. Uh, here you see two characters from Brian Vaughn and Fiona Staples' saga saying, I just wanted to make sure everyone was on the same page before this next part. Indeed, those circles are all of my students and myself uh, who ran across nine panels doing close readings of these pages in a shared space. Uh, in this way, using a kind of augmented reality or, or mixed reality, at least in audio terms, to try to relate to each other while doing collaborative close reading. Beyond 3D audio, we've also been able to navigate two-dimensional proximate video spaces to do close readings of comics. Uh, in this instance, getting close with soft lead, and in another instance, reading Asterius Polyp in small groups in a way that we're able to gather together, disperse, and reconvene over close readings of specific images in virtual spaces. Beyond these experiments, we can use the inbuilt tools of Zoom itself to try to break the window. One of the things I've had my students do every week is find a selected image from the comic we're discussing that represents their uh, closest interests, something they would like to discuss further or look at more closely to use as their background. Uh, in this way, the students are all able to present something from the comic uh, within the image that they're presenting themselves to their peers. Now, there's a whole range of tools here. Animes is something that does facial rigging, uh, which is the same thing that Snap Camera does. Snap Camera, of course, has been made famous by potatoes and cats you may have seen online, but really is a sophisticated augmented reality platform for reading our faces and producing something in their place. 
Now, this is something I've used in a lot of my classes. Uh, here's a kind of combination of a variety of 3D avatars and Snap Camera so that my students don't have to participate in the class uh, live, but can be there as avatars, as, say, a penguin or an awkward duck or a baby Yoda. Now, this directly leads into the kind of avatars that one typically uses in 3D spaces. This one is mine. And I'd like to spend the rest of my time talking about VR and the ways in which VR might replace or take the place of Zoom in the classroom. These presentations take the shape of a simulated room uh, here in relationship to the comics they were studying. So this is a room devoted to Junji Ito's extraordinary Uzumaki. Uh, we have Skim by Jillian Tamaki, uh, here rendered in a kind of sacrificial Wiccan space that features prominently in the narrative. The Inkle by Alejandro Jodorowsky with Mobius as a seaside um, Italian villa that you descend to the depths of. Uh, Enigma, a kind of cyberpunk space by Peter Milligan and Duncan Figredo. And Hellblazer by Alan Moore. Uh, I'll let this play out just a little bit in the background um, so you can see a sense of what these rooms look like. They're comprised of images, texts, and panels, and the students are able not only to describe what they see and what they've placed in the room, uh, but they're all able to inhabit the same space together, whether it's on a headset, on their phones, uh, at their computers, uh, or, or otherwise. This kind of mixed reality environment can be played at multiple times using multiple screens. In this way, I believe these platforms enable us to bring our students together in ways that we simply haven't been able to connect over Zoom and other devices for distanced learning. Uh, I'll be continuing to explore the ways in which XR can facilitate these kinds of connections and in the meantime, uh, I'm delighted to see everything that is happening uh, with my colleagues across these departments. So with that, I want to say uh, thank you for listening, and I hope to see you in one VR space or the other. Hello, my name is Maya Manojlovic. I am a lecturer at the UCLA Writing Programs. XR became my passion after I saw Noni de la Pena's VR documentary, Hunger in Los Angeles. Since then, I gave talks on how our experiences in VR might affect our actions in the real world and expand our environmental consciousness. I participated in Oculus Launchpad for VR developers coming all over the world and co-founded the XR Garden salon-style events that brought together the diverse XR communities of Los Angeles. This is why I'm excited about XR. It's a force of convergence, creativity, and collaboration. Hi, my name is Tom Garbalotti. As the Instructional Technology Manager here at UCLA's Humanities Technology Department, I am always looking towards a broader implementation of innovative technology into a regular classroom. Experimentation is exciting and fun, but getting it into the general classroom, where it has a low barrier to entry and enhances the curriculum, is key for me. I think of XR as being exactly this kind of innovative technology. Hi, I'm Annalie Rugg, and I'm the Director and Humanities CIO at UCLA Humanities Technology. In my role at UCLA, I need to look out for platforms and tools to innovate or enrich teaching and learning. I'm interested in XR as an exploratory environment where you can try and fail without consequences, whether it is examining and manipulating data or walking the virtual alleys 
of a foreign land and fully experiencing language in situ. Scribe VR got off the ground thanks to some institutional support. TDG and startup UCLA's Faculty Innovation Fellowship Program gave us an opportunity to think entrepreneurially and translate our idea into creating a business case. The program offered workshops on customer development, legal issues, fundraising, and pitching, as, as well as several individual consultation sessions with their fantastic team. They connected us to ZAP, an LA regional iCorps program that challenged us to construct a business canvas for our lean startup and target concrete customer segments with customer discovery interviewing techniques. We used our Faculty Innovation Fellowship funding to create an animation of our concepts prototype. Combined, these resources helped us to refine our pitch for potential funders. Please take a look. Scribe VR is an application concept enabling composition, ideation, self-expression and connection in a 360-degree virtual reality environment. Scribe VR gets us to move. Moving freely in a limitless environment inspires us to be creative and reimagine how we think, compose and connect. Teachers, give your students a fun way to use both mind and body to self-express, compose and learn new languages. Writers and mashup artists move through space to create, deconstruct and recompose words, texts and symbols. Inscribe VR, choose your avatar, a visual environment, and add ambient sounds and music. Import a chosen text or character set, or explore and have fun with the world's words and symbols in the Scribe VR repository. You can also play with friends. Shared composition in Scribe VR exposes us to new and unexpected perspectives and creations. Scribe VR has no competitor in the VR arena. In a world gone remote, the potential market for Scribe VR in education, health, and business is huge, while prices for headsets and hardware are rapidly decreasing. We are looking for partnerships, advisors, and funding to develop and market our VR app to educators, creatives, mental health services, and corporate team building. Join us in making Scribe VR a reality. Our idea has always been free the word, free the characters and symbols, unhitch them from margins and lines in two dimensions. Let's express our ideas by manipulating and moving words and characters in any dimension, direction, without prescribed order or rules or expectations. In the context of college education, ScribeVR becomes a platform for inspiring and teaching creativity with no judgment and encouraging experimentation where failure is irrelevant. Beyond education, Scribe VR has application in many other markets, as a therapeutic tool for trauma victims, as a platform for mashup artists, as a creative movement activity for child care providers and parents. We all want to create, move freely, express ourselves, and have fun. Scribe VR reintroduces the fun into language and establishes a rightful place for exploratory composition in the virtual reality and gaming realm. Technical key to the success of ScribeVR will be its flexibility in importing languages for creation, all within a customizable virtual space that fosters creativity. Western alphabets, character-based languages, and other types of script such as numbers, formula, even musical notation can be imported through a universal standardized file format such as a CSV. This would even include emoji.
The main technical challenge for Scribe VR lies with the rapidly changing XR environment. Recently, we've had two major shifts, the pandemic with the shift to remote teaching that it brought on and the introduction of lower cost standalone headsets. When first conceived, Scribe VR leveraged a tethered headset and uploading files into the program would be a simple and straightforward process. With the standalone version, we'll need to reconsider how to import these custom character sets and environments in a way that's as easy as possible for the end user. For all the pandemic has wrought, however, it has highlighted the usefulness of XR in education and increased its potential for use. This, combined with the lower cost headsets, provides a much richer landscape for Scribe VR and indeed the entire XR community. So um, it's time for uh, our Q&A. Francesca, do you want to begin? Sure. Um, so with that, we're opening it up to a Q&A. You can type your questions in our Q&A box below on the bottom of your Zoom. Um, but in the meantime, I thought I'd start with a few questions and, and maybe we can go around and exchange uh, questions. I was really interested, uh, Stephen, in um, the annotations are, an ex are excellent for both teaching and research that you've developed for iPads as uh, clip notes and also for 2D films. What are the challenges students and teachers might face when learning how to annotate 3D films in VR? Yeah, that's a really great question because when you put a headset on, it's really difficult to use a keyboard. <laughs> so it's difficult to enter text. So I was, uh, I very much enjoyed seeing the, the, the Scribe VR project because figuring out how to use language within VR is a real challenge. What I've had to do to create annotations is uh, work in a 2D environment, but with 3D movies, what that required was making what's called anaglyph versions of it, which is like the old time way you would put on glasses in order to, to watch a film. So I guess the basic answer to that is that um, to create an annotations, I had to do it in a 2D environment, but where VR is really great is uh, being able to point at something and get a whole bunch of text and watch movies in, in connection with it so that you're in a 3D environment. And also 3D movies really do look fabulous in a VR environment as opposed to how they look on a flat screen with, uh, with, with glasses. So um, uh, I guess the short answer is you create the stuff outside, or at least that's what I've been kind of forced to do. But once you brought it into VR, then it's a, a really great environment. And I'm glad you, I appreciate you mentioning my Clip Notes app, which is one of four I've done for iPads that are all free. And if uh, anybody searches my name in the uh, iOS app store on, a, on an iPad, they'll be able to see those. We have a few coming through on the Q&A. Um, Maya or Joy, do you want to maybe bring some of those forward? For our panelists? I'm wondering, um, specifically, Lisa's asking, Tom, can you talk generally about students' reactions to XR instructional applications? Tom, or maybe Maya, or Anna. Yeah, I, I will I will be happy uh, uh, to respond. Yes. Um, so uh, actually, uh, 
Tom uh, Garbellotti and Humtech enabled me to use XR in the classroom. Uh, but uh, this was when uh, the instruction was still face to face. So we used it in a classroom in a video game rhetoric and design course. Uh, students were really excited to try out this new tool. And um, some of them even decided to create their final project, um, which was to kind of conceptualize the whole video game they decided to do it as a VR. They found it as an interesting storytelling challenge. And they found it very fascinating to kind of like shift from, uh, you know, just thinking about a video games as something that you interact into the, uh, to VR. But, you know, this was literally a couple of years ago. Um, so, now we have a lot of VR video games already and they are all over the place. And now students are really invested into trying to learn about this uh, tools more. I'll be happy to talk more about this, but. Yes, absolutely. Um, and maybe I know we're short on time for our Q and A, but I wanted to ask uh, Joy and um, Anthony, what are some other tools that you've used for AR. I know you've been working with Vectorworks. Would you like to talk a little bit more about how you use this tool in particular? Sure. Uh, well, Vectorworks is a 2D, 3D CAD environment that also allows you to build models and push them into the AR environment. Uh, and one of the nice things about it is that it's fairly easy for students to understand how to do that. That's always been uh, in my opinion, impediment to actually using these tools is the kind of complex nature of actually deploying something. Uh, and then once you taught them how to do it, that technology would change abruptly and you'd have to kind of start over. So now things are becoming uh, a little more standard. Uh, Vectorworks allows them to basically build components. Uh, one of the projects uh, that you saw, uh, Francis's project that he was doing the photogrammetry that was actually brought through Vectorworks. He created the photogrammic model and then he imported it into Vectorworks. And then from Vectorworks, he simplified it, which means uh, making a fairly complex model just a little bit simpler. It still looks good, but from the perspective of the hardware, it's easier to move around. And then he pushed it up into a cloud app that is on a mobile device, a phone or uh, an iPad. And he was able to go downtown and point it at a building and turn it on. And lo and behold, be able to see his work floating out in the middle of the street. So I think that kind of tool getting it in the hands of students uh, is really amazing. Yeah, and I remember uh, a different group of students also um, redesigned the marquees from the theaters and also used that in the Vectorworks AR app. And similarly to Danny Snelson, um, I think we had a previous group um, even interact with the Snap Camera AR. So that was another tool that we incorporated in a capstone. That's great. I, I have one from um, our Q&A box that I thought um, could anyone could answer this one. Um, what softwares would you recommend for newcomers to start designing interactive 3D environments um, from start to finish? And maybe just where, where did you get started in your XR journey and um, how has that developed over time? And what would you recommend for people who are just starting off? Um, I, I'm not sure if you were directing that at me, but um, I think uh, there's a there's a couple. Uh, uh, Unity, which keeps getting mentioned, is uh, is one of those which started out as a game engine, but they added uh, VR capabilities fairly early, and it's also a good environment for doing 2D and 3D uh, uh, simultaneously. There's also the Unreal Engine, it's called, which is done by the same people who did Fortnite. And it's got a little bit steeper of a learning curve, but the tools they provide are really beautiful. And uh, um, it's probably worth taking the effort to do that. So I'd say Unity and Unreal are the, the, the two main ones for getting started. And, and maybe the Scribe VR group, I mean, you're developing the tool from scratch. Uh, where do you plan to take it from here? Maybe you can expand on that too. Oh, thank you for the question. Well, you know, exactly this is our challenge. Uh, with the pandemic, we kind of got uh, stopped uh, and we couldn't really work on it as much as we would like to. But right now, our 
goal is to really create a prototype, an interactive prototype for VR, yes, with Unity designers uh, and, um, you know, really create the whole 3D environment where one can interact in um, actually. And hopefully uh, we will um, find some funding and support uh, to really um, expand, you know, just the basic idea into being able to create your own environments uh, or import variety of environments such as, you know, natural environment um, or, you know, sea, underwater, um, whatever, um, and um, also add sound that a soundscape that, you know, of it, one's choice. So that was our idea. <laughs> yeah, Tom, I, I think, uh, is, your, is your sound issue worked out? Yeah, I'm sorry, it was no, I had no, a conflict. No problem. Um, uh, we have a question uh, in the chat saying, how far are we from intuitive LMS integration with these VR apps and the browser-based ones in particular. Maybe you and Annalie have some insight into that. As far as LMS integrations, that's a that's a that's a more long way away. And I think a lot of it has to do with lack again of, of um, device penetration in the market. Right? Students, even at three hundred dollars for a inexpensive headset, it still can be a, 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 an issue for for a lot of students due to economic reasons. Um, <clears throat> We did find using some 360 videography that seeing it flat on uh, a web browser at least was a way to kind of balance that out. So, and that can be done basically through, here at UCLA we have Kaltura, they actually have a 360 uh, video player that, that functions. Uh, so we have that capability today if we have the footage to actually to work with. Um, but as far as like a nice, one click integration with the LMS, I think we're still a ways off. And some of that's going to depend on the economic situation with software development for education. You know, if a company comes up with the product they want to sell, then they'll develop an integration for it, right? For us, and like with Scribe VR, we could do that if we had a project and it had the project at a state where we could, we could build a tie it in, but there's going to be obviously development costs with that. Thank you so much. I think that's really um, thoughtful. And I want to sort of build off of this question of uh, building under pandemic conditions. We have a question from Erin uh, Riley saying, what type of issues have you had in the past year with giving access to this technology in students' homes? So i.e. access to headsets or being able to do XR work uh, or research remotely. And how have your XR alliances uh, across UCLA supported this? I would say right now um, with the XRI, uh, the X Reality Initiative that we have, it's kind of just starting off. So um, that's why I think it's really important that we can pull these resources from across campus because um, we don't really know how many headsets are out there that we can actually um, lend out to students. So. I think it's important to kind of gather all the resources and um, be able to assess like how best we can uh, meet student needs. I know that um, Stanford recently, uh, they have a course coming out where um, the university has already purchased over a hundred headsets for their students um, to lend out. So um, right now we just really need the funding to, um, to get that kind of started. Yeah. And if I could just add real quickly here, um, we at UCLA uh, with an XR initiative uh, has actually created very productive um, uh, alliances with um, the UCLA residential life where they have many, many labs uh, that are very well equipped with video gaming equipment. And also they have created a whole um, lab dedicated to experimentation with XR where they have available all kinds of headsets and, and um, software to create with XR. 
Um, and we hope to revive all these connections now when the campus is slowly kind of reviving back uh, into face-to-face -face environment. And I also know that sanitation would probably be um, kind of a topic and uh, especially in our post-COVID world. So um, the studio space that uh, I'm kind of building out in SSC or SSCert, I'm sorry, um, we purchased um, a machine from Cleanbox that will actually sanitize the headsets within a minute. And this has been tested with uh, previous viruses as well. So we're definitely thinking ahead about the safety and the health of our students and faculty. And I think we have time for maybe just one more question. Um, and this is, I thought, uh, a, another good one from our from our chat here. Um, it says AR seems to have a lower barrier for content creation and use. Can um, maybe S Steve and uh, Joy and Anthony talk about? Can you discuss the added benefit of immersive VR versus something like AR? Well, I think it has to do with the type of environment that you ultimately want to use it in. So in the case of the work I'm doing right now, which is largely with historic theaters in downtown Los Angeles, um, you would really not, it's not really the environment for a completely immersive event. Uh, it works far better uh, on a phone or mobile device to reveal some aspects about the buildings and structures and history that's already there. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, and Steve and Joy can probably uh, get into this a little bit more, um, I think that if you're, uh, you want to uh, experience a structure or a place that doesn't exist anymore at all, immersive is really the way to go. So I think it really is environment specific and project specific. Go ahead, Joy, if you want. Yeah, um, I think I think that's a great question. Um, right now, you know, as the research is sort of catching up to um, to sort of measure the outcomes of how students are reacting to VR experiences, um, I think it's a great opportunity to sort of um, be at the forefront and to just create these these environments for them to experience. Because as we all know, we all like learn things in different ways, and so I think VR could really help um, just uh, with the engagement that students. Uh, sometimes struggle with, um, especially, you know, with these Zoom classrooms. And um, I'm sure a lot of instructors are thinking about ways that they can make their content more interactive. And um, there's definitely been research that has shown that um, that students retain more that um, if they're able to interact with their environment and to really get that knowledge ingrained. So. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, if you had any more thoughts to add to that. No, I think you guys did a good job with that. Well, great with that. Thank you all so much for your presentations. This was really, really a fruitful discussion. And um, for the rest of the questions, we'll allow the panelists to respond as we start part two. So they can respond um, via text or typing, typing answers to you, or you can email them um, and follow up afterwards. So thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. Hi, I'm David Gear, director of the UCLA Art and Global Health Center. 15 years ago, when I was teaching a class called Make Art Stop AIDS, my colleague Robert Sember thrust a copy of A Broken Landscape into my hands. It was a compilation of photographs of people living with HIV and AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa, all taken by the South African photographer Gideon Mendel. I tracked down Mendel in London and told him how much I loved and appreciated his work, especially for its essential humanity. Over the subsequent years, we were able to launch Through Positive Eyes, a photo storytelling project in which people living with HIV around the world take their own photos and tell their own stories to dispel the stigma associated with HIV. 
In 2019, we curated images and stories from more than 130 people living in 10 international cities to constitute through positive eyes at the UCLA Fowler Museum. Just prior to the closing in 2020, Dr. Francesca Albrezzi documented the exhibition using a 360 camera. Now, on our throughpositiveeyes.org website, students and members of the public can experience the Fowler's version of the exhibition from wherever they are in the world. I'm Francesca Albrezzi. I'm a digital research consultant with the Office of Advanced Research Computing here at UCLA. I work with faculty across campus to support their digital research needs, and my area of expertise is XR. I also sometimes teach in the World Arts and Culture slash Dance Department and in the Digital Humanities Program. I did my graduate work in the Department of World Arts and Cultures, so I knew of the Arts and Global Health Center and the Through Positive Eyes Project for my time there. But when I saw the exhibition at the Fowler Museum, I was really moved and I reached out to David to see if he and his team would be interested in having it documented using Matterport 360 technology. Knowing the exhibition was scheduled to travel, I thought an XR capture might be useful for people to virtually experience how the exhibition was done at the Fowler. Perhaps to compare it to other installations on the tour or simply to reach a wider digital audience that might not have been able to see it in person. The team was incredibly supportive of the idea and the Fowler staff allowed me into the space the day after the exhibition closed to complete a 360 photogrammetric capture before it was deinstalled. The capture was subject to some limitations which affected the level of quality we could achieve. Things came together extremely fast, so there was no time for pre-production or planning. Aaron Connors from the Fowler generously opened the gallery for me, waiting nearly two hours while we captured the space. We chose to use a fairly powerful, but lightweight 360 camera, the Insta360 1X, in combination with the Matterport mobile app, so we could move quickly through the space, taking spherical captures every several feet, noted by these circular rings, in order to create a photogrammetric 3D model. Due to the time frame, we weren't able to adjust for lighting or use a Matterport camera, which would have enhanced the quality of the capture. For example, this last room was lit with red lights, but it appears more of a purple in hue in the capture. Nevertheless, the capture does give a compelling sense of the exhibition space and design. And the Matterport platform provides users the ability to experience the space as a 3D model, a flat floor plan, or as desktop or immersive VR. Next, we added an annotation layer while the Through Positive Eyes website provides a different view of much of the work presented and more, we wanted this layer of the virtual experience to stay close to what work and information was provided in the physical exhibition. We color-coded the annotation pips. Green was used for labels with text and high-resolution images. Red was used for embedded video. The annotations allow users to view the media directly in the virtual space. A few challenges we encountered with the annotations involve placement and text limit. The exhibition was designed with these stations of various works presented on either side of the pedestals placed in the center of the room, like a forest you could weave through. As photos are stitched together to create a model of the space, this design presents an interesting challenge for the placement of annotations. The base of the pedestal was used as a guide and annotations were set on either side. We chose not to include the artivist headshots that were on the stands as additional annotations as to not further overwhelm the virtual space. These can be viewed on the Through Positive Eyes website. 
Finally, the description text for the annotations is limited to 1,000 characters in the platform. So in one case, we chose to stack annotations. So the full body of text could be read in two parts. One outstanding question for this project is how we can best represent the interactions that happened within the exhibition space. Currently, students are working on a text analysis and documentation project connected to the participatory note wall installation that invited exhibition visitors to leave notes with thoughts and feelings, memories, and the like. There may be a way that we can share that work in this virtual space in order to better communicate the intention of this area of the exhibition. Additionally, several artivist performances occurred in the final room of the exhibition as part of related museum programming. We may incorporate these recordings and perhaps use a different color pip to distinguish them from the other annotations. Exhibitions are like dances. They're ephemeral. The virtual capture not only allows for preservation, but also for greater and continued access. As we take the exhibition to new cities, we're in Seattle now, the Fowler version of the show can still be viewed for comparison and study, which feels significant to us both creatively and archivally. Thank you. In 1970, Bruce Nauman created one of the first works of video installation art titled Live Taped Video Corridor. As viewers get closer to the monitor at the end of a long, narrow corridor, their image becomes smaller and harder to see, complicating the pleasures of seeing and being seen. Live VR Corridor is a mixed reality experience that is part physical and part virtual, operating at the intersection of embodiment and sensation, perception and desire. The project is an homage to Nauman and a reminder that virtual reality shares a history with video and installation art. Live VR Corridor rewards patience, contemplation and curiosity tracking the viewer's gaze and bringing the surfaces of the corridor to life. The image on the top monitor shrinks as the viewer approaches it. The bottom monitor shows a live feed from the camera in the head-mounted display. An impatient viewer will see their image shrink to just a few pixels in size. A calm viewer who takes time to experience the textures and sounds of the corridor can coax the image to grow back to full size. Touch is more useful than sight. Looking becomes touching. Seeing becomes feeling. Images on the monitors multiply, reverse, and displace the viewer's point of view. Viewers may momentarily forget their physical surroundings in order to explore, play, or simply experience their body in a new space and time. Virtual X is a collaboration between the Department of Film, TV, and Digital Media and UCLA's Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. The project uses virtual reality to invite reflection on how environmental cues affect students' feelings of belonging at UCLA. Machine learning was used to generate synthetic humans reflecting a range of faculty demographics based on real academic departments at UCLA. 
Using a combination of gaze tracking and change blindness, viewers unknowingly create incremental changes in their environment, marked by real images, flyers, posters, and signs drawn from every instructional building on campus. As viewers scan the room, software keeps track of the images that have been observed, triggering unseen transitions in the environment. Rather than rely on empathy to generate a singular emotional response, Virtual X embraces the intellectual challenge of creating a diversely welcoming and inclusive campus environment. Hi, my name is Jeff Burke. I'm a professor in the theater department and one of the faculty directors of UCLA REMAP, a joint center of the School of Theater, Film, and Television and the Samuel E. School of Engineering. I'm gonna talk very briefly about research and live experiences in extended reality, starting with an AR and immersive theater project called The Most Favored Nation. This is a still in progress uh, student faculty and staff uh, effort to create an immersive theater experience that incorporates uh, augmented reality to tell an original story within the world of the streaming series, The Man in the High Castle. It involves a large number of students, faculty, and staff. And what you're seeing here is a sample mobile AR view from the stage of one of our theaters that shows an overlay of AR content from one timeline in the story in which the Allied powers have won World War II uh, on top of a physical set uh, that tells a, a sort of different story uh, of a timeline in which the Axis powers have won uh, World War II. And so you can see a bit of that physical set off to the side here as we turn around. In the streaming series, it's a set of newsreels. In our piece, it's a device that allows the audience members and the characters to explore a timeline in which the other side uh, won. We don't have time to go into the storylines that the students have created in 1960s Chicago, really these two Chicagos um, that the audience can follow. But I wanna highlight a sort of technical aspect of the approach that's been uh, really fascinating for us. On the left, you're gonna see in this video an example of a mobile AR view. Uh, on the upper right, a view of the person who's walking around the physical set uh, to see that view. And then in the bottom right, a uh, operator view actually across the Atlantic uh, with one of our collaborators who is looking at a VR view of all of the elements in AR plus what the audience member is seeing uh, more or less in real time. And it's this idea that we are creating stories within a multi-user simulation that can provide different perspectives to different people, uh, whether they're audience members or operators, that's become really fascinating for us. I'll run just a little bit of this. A lot of our testing has been sort of this on-stage portion, so that's why what we're talking about sounds like an immersive theater production. And then as we go into what we're doing in the next fall, it's sort of now thinking about how we deliver it. It's super cool. Well, that's great, too. Uh, Erica, you want to take the video? Yeah, go ahead. Mira, do you want to explain a little sure. bit about what we're doing? So, we were really fortunate to work with our actors um, by sending them green screen. And since we couldn't do ball cap, we did two-sided green screen planes. So, um, Jeff, if you can go to Peter and show sort of how we have it, so it's like rotating. And obviously it's clear at some point that it's a, a, a 2D plane, but it actually simulates sort of this idea of oh, wow. the space pretty well. And so you see we have the flat moment, but then now it feels again back towards cool. Yeah. So in the middle of developing that show, the pandemic hit, and we didn't know when there would be an opportunity to perform in the same place again. And so we started to explore in parallel how some of those same technologies that are being used to create a mobile AR experience could be used to create a fully virtual performance environment uh, with a shared space 
for actors who were spread out across the country and in some cases across the world. And so that experimentation was looking at how a game engine, you know, kind of a key component of extended reality thinking could be combined with video conferencing technology to pull remote actors into a shared virtual environment that was also um, creative and engaging visually and provided a, a fantastic opportunity for our designers to learn a new medium that they were working in. And so this was a, a production of The Last Days of Judas Iscariot with actors that were performing on their own in a remote space and composited in real time into this 3D environment uh, set in motion by the designers. This research involves a number of different simultaneous threads from creating stories and ways of telling stories that exercise extended reality ideas in a certain way to the collaborative processes and workflows that make it possible to do them live to the software components that need to be designed and built to make those things possible. And one of the exciting kind of cross-cutting ideas is the notion of working uh, in a real-time and iterative way that's enabled by XR technologies and, and in particular game engines. Um, and a move from the old model of content production on the left to a more iterative real-time model suggested on the right where we can put people into the experience that they're creating as it's under development and see holistically how it may work when multiple people are interacting in a shared environment that's being created uh, around a single goal. So one of the exciting directions uh, that's happening next for us is to take some of those real-time ideas, some of the extended reality experience from the pandemic and start to re-enter the physical world in our thinking and explore hybrid experiences that use technologies like LED walls to uh, bring XR experiences that we've been doing remotely um, on stage and into physical environments. And in particular, we're working on a pilot with the Anderson School of Management around immersive learning experiences that involve uh, both in-person and remote students using some of these technologies. So I'd be happy to talk more about these ideas or answer questions by email. Thanks very much. So, so thank you so much presenters for this incredible work and presentations. So with that, I would just like to open uh, the Q&A and um, I will just start um, with the first team uh, through the positive eyes with David Gere and Francesca Albrezzi. Um, I found um, all your materials very, very moving. Uh, when I was exploring them on my own. And I was just wondering if perhaps you could speak a little bit more about how the 360 experience of the exhibition in virtual reality complements and perhaps also extends the live experience of the exhibition. Hmm. Shall I dive in a little bit first, Francesca, and then I, I invite you to join me. Yes, please, please do. You know, I have to say that as a person who is very interested in live experiences, you know, live theater, live exhibition, uh, I think there are things that happen when you walk into an exhibition space that are visceral, uh, that are meaningful. Uh, you pick up a tone, you can be uh, moved by a, a set of images even before you know what they are. And I think that the 360 version the VR version of it requires a commitment 
Like you have to really, you know, believe that you're going to spend some time and you're going to go deep and you're going to, you know, click on various links in order to get more information. Without the more information, you don't get the, the range of emotion that's available in the live experience. But you do really get those details. So, you know, it's, it's I think, a, a, you know, as always, it's a trade-off between the, the visceral, the immediate on the one hand, and what you can get from deeper study that comes in the 360 version. That would be my take on it. Francesca, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, some of what we discussed in the presentation was the way that the digital doesn't quite always translate well enough to the actual experience, like that last room that's sort of a deeper blood red in, in reality and came out a bit purple in the capture. But I, I think what's important, uh, at least on my end and coming out of museum studies is to think about how we teach um, curation and sort of the art of display and what that, how we elicit those visceral reactions by placing things in space and creating an environment that brings different art pieces together in really powerful ways. And to be able to teach that in a way that is more contextual than just here's a picture, here's a picture, but allowing people to sort of experience the space really changes how we might think about sharing that knowledge and also um, preserving it for the future and, and giving a different kind of broader contextualization for the archive. Uh, and I think also, in, in, uh, David can maybe talk a little bit more about the way the exhibition is traveling. So in different iterations, in different spaces, this has a very different feel. So being able to sort of preserve at least one of the spaces and sharing that um, in, a, in a remote way can be very useful, I think, for teaching that. Yeah. yeah, it sounds fascinating. Like you are really bringing sort of this experience from the museum into the classroom for students to be able to inter interact with it in a deepened way. Um, David. Perfect. Yeah, I think that the, the crucial point here is that it works really well for study, really well um, for the, the more in-depth engagement. Uh, the the elements that you can experience when you walk into an exhibition sometimes may, might come across better in a, in a straightforward photograph. Um, it, it, Francesca, since you raised it, uh, the first exhibition, full exhibition of this material was in Durban, South Africa, then in Cape Town, then uh, actually in between the Johannesburg and Cape Town. So there are three South African cities, each quite different one from the other, and then to the Fowler. And so within the realm of museum studies and, and curatorial uh, uh, framing, there's no question that it's incredibly useful to be able to see the very fine details, the granular details of what it was that was going on inside the exhibition. And you know, for things like design, it may be more useful to see uh, an exhibition photo, a display uh, photo to see like what, it, what you witnessed when you came in the front door. So you know, we get different things from, from uh, different approaches, but I, I, for one, I have to say how grateful I was and am to Francesca for her diving in at that last possible moment before the exhibition closed or before the campus closed to be able to document what was going on in that exhibition because otherwise it was gone forever, just gone, out of trace. Yeah. yeah. Well, this, this really sounds wonderful and I'm so happy that both of you have elaborated really on the pedagogic moment here um, in relation to XR because there were a lot of question in relation to that. Uh, in the chat, so I hope that this has answered those questions, at least partially. So with that, I would like to move on to Steve Anderson. Um, Steve, you have been writing about VR, experimenting with VR, teaching VR, and doing all kinds of things. And you know, would would um, you know? Could you please talk a little bit more about? this video documentation um, of the two projects that you have presented for us. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Maya. So um, I've not only been writing and thinking about it a lot, I've been getting really cranky about the way lots of people talk about VR, um, especially back, you know, both of these projects were rooted in a particular moment of real industry hyperbole shortly after Facebook bought Oculus and there was kind of like all of this enthusiasm and no one's ever done this before. It's never been tried. Um, and that's just not true. You know, I was, I was very glad that we started this conference with Steve Mamber's overview 
of historical cinematic technologies, because I think all of these things, none of them emerge in a vacuum. All of them are related to these much longer histories. And so the pedagogical context for those projects was coming out of a class in which I was really trying to get students to think about history and the interconnections between contemporary technologies and you know experimental media art from the 60s, 70s, 80s. So um, both of those things were, were kind of responsive projects. You know, the the like all of the prevailing wisdom about empathy as being the way that you can reach people and change people's minds or give them an experience of, of what it's like to be another person. Um, you know, I think that's kind of really naive and problematic. Um, so the, the Bruin VR project, the Bruin X project was really about kind of like trying to say, let's appeal to the intellect rather than to the emotion um, and to try to open up those possibilities and not have it be something that's, you know, overwhelmed by, by kind of hype and, and overstatement. Thank you, Steve, so much. Um, maybe we will have time to come back to what you're talking about and, you know, but since you raised this issue of all these shifting perspectives that are possible and also intellectual engagement and not just purely emotional. Um, so I would like to move to um, Jeff Burke um, and um, his project, um, Live Experiences in XR with Remap. And um, so Jeff, you as well have been experimenting and doing all kinds of stuff um, with um, various technologies and performances and uh, multiple simultaneous perspectives and all this stuff. So, you know, why is it important for you to explore and experiment with the ways in which XR and other technologies sort of modulate performance? You know, just what is your vision for the future of your storytelling? Thanks. Um, I think we have, I saw the one minute message go by in the chat. So I'll, I'll try to answer that really quickly. I, I think it's um, what I've been most interested in is trying to understand how to see the tools that are in wide use elsewhere, sort of challenged by artists, um, specifically around creating live or real time experiences. So if you think of where so much development um, on the technical side has happened. It's been driven by the game industry. It's been driven by um, cinema. It's been driven by software and pre-visualization and things that were kind of inherently coming from um, different models of production. And I think what's interesting about performance is it's starting from that real-time immersive live perspective on things that several people have alluded to here and immediately looking for holes in these platforms and, and kind of challenging us to think about them differently. And I find it really productive that it, it's just a, a kind of collision of different methodologies that I think by trying to move into a live and real time focus um, is sort of encouraging us to think about the technologies differently. Um, I have a lot of other things to, to say, but I know we're, we're short on, on time. Um, I just find that collision uh, pretty productive for us. Um, Jeff, thank you so much for this. <laughs> and all the panelists, uh, like your work is just so inspiring and exciting. And it's just, uh, you know, so transdisciplinary. Um, so, um, with that, you know, uh, Joy, just posted um, a note in the chat um, to check out uh, the virtual environments of Mozilla Hubs and look for fun Easter eggs that uh, Francesca and Joy have set up for you there. So, um, you know, just click on that link or uh, there's also a link on the TDG website. Um, and so with that, uh, I want to thank everybody for attending this webinar. Uh, this was really a great opportunity for us. And I'd like to thank all of the presenters for your incredible innovations. And our um, UCLA XR initiative would love to again thank TDG, uh, your fantastic team for all your help with this organization and for your support. Thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend. <laughs> Bye.